And Super High Level, thank you again for joining us for Elevating E-Commerce. We are super excited today. We have an awesome panel with all of these great brands you can see up here of Wandering Bear, Auto Brush, Tushy, and Dr. Squatch. So we're gonna get a lot of different areas of the e-commerce and retail space today, talking about balancing automation and personalization. So getting the boring stuff out of the way first, I am your host, Jeremy Horowitz, uh, the Director of Marketing here at Dacity. And I am really excited to dive in. A couple of things, housekeeping, everybody is muted to kick off. Um, if you have any questions, please submit them to the QA module, and then my team will be sharing it with all the panelists. And the session will be recorded, so for any reason, if you have to jump, we'll be sharing this afterwards if there's a great thing that you wanted to come back to. So let's get into the good stuff. Uh, we're just going to go around Robin, have everyone introduce themselves. So Kendra, do you mind kicking us off with a quick background on yourself and what you're working on over at Dr. Squatch? Yeah, happy to. So my name is Kendra Jackson. I'm the director of customer experience at Dr. Squatch. Um, we're a men's personal care brand. We started as kind of more focused on soap, but now we make a lot of other great products that have manly smells and uh, make you feel great uh, and are natural. Um, and I guess a little bit back background about me. So I started my career off um, in higher education and then went back to business school and transitioned to B2B customer service, which is like very different. So I was in the financial services business and uh, doing really high touch customer experiences and customer service. And um, I transitioned over to more to B2C work. And I tried to bring a lot of that really high touch experience to B2C at scale. And it's it's a mix of you know having to use automation to reach our millions of customers, but also still want, wanting to give them that kind of great white glove service so that they can be advocates for our brand. Um, so as director of customer experience at Dr. Squatch, I do customer service, which is a big part of what I do. And then our net promoter score program and some of our personalization. And then finally I run our community team. So it's pretty broad awesome. spectrum of customer experiences. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna have a lot to dive into there. Uh, Megan, you wanna give a quick background on yourself and Wandering Bear? Sure. Um, so I'm Megan Whitman. I'm the VP of growth at Wandering Bear. Um, I've actually only been at Wandering Bear since April of this year, uh, as they actually just launched their direct consumer business late last year as a result of COVID. Um, so they've had seen some really great success in the growth that they've accomplished in the first few months after launching the direct consumer site. Um, so I came on board to kind of help help expand that growth. Um, Previously, I've been at um, other VP of growths at other companies in the beauty space, as well as the um, health and wellness space. Awesome. Ren, how about yourself? Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Ren Fuller-Wasserman, the director of CX at Tushy. Um, we are revolutionizing the American bathroom um, through principally a modern bidet attachment. That was our first product. And since then we've launched lots of different products all for the bathroom, focusing on sustainability. So we have bamboo toilet paper, bum towels, which is what came to mind uh, when you asked about the beach towels <laughs> and um, all different accoutrements to help your pooping and general bathroom experience, um, including our latest greatest, which is a sustainable and disposable, fully uh, biodegradable toilet brush, which is the first on the market. Um, so before um, Tushy, I came to Tushy um, as a COVID refugee in March, 2020. I had just recently launched a online travel marketplace in November of 2019, very timely. Um, and I thought it would be a quick blip until this thing was over. And here I am uh, a year and a half later and loving it. Um, before, uh, the online marketplace, which is called wavecation still around, um, I operated the first, uh, shipping container coffee concept in Los Angeles. And before that, um, I was, you know, in the nonprofit space startup world. And before that I was 10 years as a teacher. So a lot of what I learned about CX really just goes back to the basics of um, working with kids and um, enhancing that experience all around. So at Tushy, I'm primarily focused on customer service. Um, we have another team that does all of our community management, but there is a lot of overlap here. So, yeah. Very cool. And Atul, bring us home. Yeah. So uh, my name is Atul. I'm the manager of customer experience at Autobrush. Auto brush is a mouthpiece style toothbrush. It brushes all of your teeth uh, simultaneously. Um, and so we're, we're looking really to revolutionize the way K 
kids and, and adults brush their teeth. And we also provide uh, whitening solutions too. Um, so I've been with Otterbrush for a year and a half and uh, <clears throat> I primarily manage the customer service side as well. Um, I've been in the D2C and e-commerce uh, space managing customer experience teams for about four years now. And uh, yeah. Very cool. Okay, so let's dive in right into the good stuff. So first question, we're going to go just right for it. How, do you, how are you currently managing machine learning and personalization at the scale of all of your businesses in your different customer communications? So Megan, I'm going to put you on the hot seat first. All right. Well, I'll focus um, more so on the machine learning aspect since I think personalization at scale, I think a lot of people are doing in terms of abandoned cart and post-purchase flows and some of the more simplistic things um, that you can really achieve with scale. So on the machine learning side, um, Wandering Bear is a pretty small team, very new team. And so we really just focus on what tools we use and what those tools offer for us in terms of, of machine learning. Um, some of the ways that we're utilizing the features that are built, we're certainly not building them ourselves, um, would be uh, we use Klaviyo for our ESP. Um, they've got a lot of great, great tools that they've rolled out where we can actually do smart send time tests and uh, it tests different engagement um, rates with, during different times of day as it like uh, sends out your email to different uh, segments of customers and actually tells you when the best time to send your emails are uh, based on time zone. A-B tests that actually start uh, getting data real time um, with a small segment of people and then learns uh, what the best subject line or whatever the test that you're running is for that time and um, actually sends to the winner once it determines the statistical significance. Um, Facebook ads are obviously a big machine learning uh, tool that we use and I'm sure a lot of other direct consumer brands use as well to get your message to a wider audience um, or should I say to the right audience as they continue to learn um, based on the customer data that you are providing them. Um, and then of course, uh, Gorgeous has been a really fantastic tool that we've been able to use to apply um, using their application of sentiment tags to determine really how customers are feeling, um, which is much more difficult than just assuming. Um, they have way smarter machine learning technology that we can utilize to better understand, um, just generally speaking, how our customers are feeling about us and um, tracking trends to make sure that they're trending in a positive direction and not a negative one. Definitely, yeah, stack is so important. Okay, so Kendra, same question to you. Yeah, I'll touch a little on personalization. Um, we aren't as heavy in machine learning in the CX team as I think we'd like to be, like we'd love to do some more implementation. But what we found is that the more automation and the more sort of like auto responses or or what feels um, can to our customers, the, the lower our CSATs dip. So we've really been thoughtful about meeting both kind of personalization and automation with people on the back end. And so really staffing up our customer support team to meet the needs of customers. Um, specifically, when we use things like a chat bot um, on our site, we find that it actually increases the number of contacts. So we do things where we try to upsell through the gorgeous chat bot. If someone's on a page for like a, just one of our bars of soap, we sort of have a pop-up that says, hey, this is John from the customer service team. Are you looking for you know a, a suggestion around um, a great bundle we have that might be helpful so you can try a bunch of soaps because we see you're like exploring this soap type and we do that automatically but on the back end it's like so important to so i feel like that's great personalization but on the back end we're right there to respond to that chat so that we can really convert them and get them what they're looking for and answer any questions that they might have I, we find that something like depends on the time of year and what's going on with our shipping, but uh, information requests make up a huge amount of the tickets that we get. And it's great for us to be kind of there right to help the customer. So we're using kind of that automation, personalization, and then finally that customer, that that person to be that final touch point with us. Definitely. Yeah. With a lot of customers, it's just like, how do you manage all of it at once? Yes, exactly. So Ren, how are you all balancing this fine line over at Toshi? Yeah, piggybacking on what both Megan and Kendra said, um, a lot of that, um, but really trying to define what are the things that make sense to automate and what are the things that you really want to keep close to the chest because like Kendra noted, people want, are looking for genuine human interactions and they feel put off by a chat bot when they know it's like 
hi, first name, you know, or something that's very obvious. Um, so I think, you know, we also use gorgeous as our CRM and with this recent addition of sentiment with machine learning, um, that can track all of the intents, um, we've set up, uh, our autoresponders and also being very clear that these are autoresponders. Um, our first foray into this, we would sign all these emails to she bot buddy, you know, like, but buddy, but people still don't know that it's a robot. So being explicit, this is an automated response, but putting in some of the things that we know that they might be asking about based on their intent. So right off the bat, sharing their order status or things like this that are unique to each user. Um, and then also thinking about proactive chat as Kendra was speaking to, you know, leveraging this fully, but when these requests come in, there's an agent that can handle them. Um, so there is this feeling like you can be playing offense, but also it's real humans, um, that are there to, uh, hold the hand of every customer, every step of the way, but looking to intense, I think is just this really great thing that gorgeous has added that really makes this process streamlined. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I feel like this is kind of a hot topic of what are your opinions on automation? Where does it live in CX? Are you for it? Are you against it? Atul, I'm going to put you on the hot seat this time. Yeah, so um, to, to Kendra's point, um, I think automation is is great, but it's always good to have someone uh, sit, sitting in the background just to make sure that uh, you're handing any over handling any overflow questions. I think the best way to implement automation is really by aggregating your pre-purchase and post-purchase questions. Um, I do this by analyzing just a few points of data. So I'll take a look at like our help center searches and article views, uh, tag data from tickets from Gorgeous, um, as well as our Facebook comment data. Um, and so we'll quantify our top questions and really determine which types of inquiries make the most sense to be personalized over automated. Then it's really all of a matter of like evaluating your current tech stack. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so uh, this might include like, um, you know, adding automation to like emails, chats, uh, even automating certain processes like returns. Um, and it also might include like looping in like ESPs like Clavio, for example, uh, to create automated email processes and marketing email processes too. In my mind, the quickest way to win with automation is just to start by testing it out. And, you know, it's going to fill probably the first couple of times, but, you know, you can always optimize off of it. I try to avoid like social media comments um, and anything that's like publicly visible just as a rule of thumb. Yeah, definitely. Just in case any of those things go wrong, you have at least an, an internal cover for it first to figure it out before it goes public facing. So Kendra, I know you started to talk about this, but yeah. how are, what are your thoughts on how are you feeling about automation and like where it fits? Yeah, I mean, I think it has a role to play because um, at least for us, like the scale we've reached is is really large. And so to, to, to help all of our customers, like we have to have some kind of automation to help them in some kind of reasonable time frame. Um, and so to me, it's just so critical that you figure out what can be automated. I do agree gorgeous and tense have been really helpful. So we're like these kinds of things we feel like we can reply automatically. Um, these kinds of things we feel like should go straight to a person. And so really like bifurcating with rules and gorgeous, like what goes where and using, we use views to really like segment out stuff that's urgent and needs like a person and should just go to a person right away versus things that could maybe have an auto reply of some kind. And we feel like that may answer the customer's question. And if it doesn't, we're right there to catch them. So I think it's just a matter of balancing, um, and planning and being thoughtful about the customer journey and the experience you want them to have around different types of issues. Um, and we do that by using tags with our team and really understanding what kinds of things are coming in and flowing in through Gorgeous and what kinds of questions we're getting. So yeah, I, it's a balance. I think it's, it has a role to play. Um, and then on the flip side, we try to be uh, really partnering with our marketing team, our lifecycle team, who's doing a lot of these things out of Clavio. And I think we're using we're using Postscripts for our text messages. And those are all like highly kind of automated, but customized, personalized. And it's great for us to be on the other end of those. So we can text customers back through Gorgeous. We can email them back. Any, any marketing email they reply to, we're right there with them. Um, and we do that at Facebook Messenger, Facebook, 
ads, like we're right there to support them if they have any questions. Um, but we use macros and other tools to just make our team more efficient. And I don't, we, we couldn't meet the demand if we didn't have those tools. Yeah, definitely. It's an important foundation, especially if you're going to meet the customer where they are in every channel. So Absolutely. Megan, I have a feeling like I know what your answer is going to be, but I want to ask you the same question of like, where does automation fit in this? Are you, against, are you for it? Or are you against it? Yes. So um, Wandering Bear is a very small team, so I'm very much for it. Um, obviously, with a small team, you have to do as much, you have to offload as much as you possibly can, offload repetitive tasks as much as you can, and a lot of the minutia that you find yourself doing on the day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think it's really important to remember that the point of any automation is really to create a deeper connection with your customer. It's not just to be fancy and not and cross things off your to-do list, um, but you have to use automation in such a way that you are fostering that connection. Um, for example, we um, have recently, we're a cold brew coffee company and we are seeing really great um, scale in our uh, in our business during the summer. And that has unfortunately led to, led to some fulfillment, fulfillment delays. Um, so we've been able to actually launch some, some um, emails going out to people if their order is not fulfilled within an acceptable time frame of, you know, one to two days um, to let them know this is what's going on. Um, here's why it's happening. Here's when we expect your order to ship. Um, and basically, you know, bear with us as we grow um, and work through some of these growing pains. And I think um, generally speaking, the response of that has been thanks for letting me know um, and supportive. And um, sometimes of course it's, wait, where's my order? Um, but that's when we can, again, jump in with our team to, to respond individually, but um, providing the customer with more information um, to let them know that we are humans behind this and humans kind of packing and shipping their order. Um, I think that, that that really fosters a deeper connection with our customers. Yeah, definitely. And it allows, it's kind of like the backbone of the engine to be very proactive about all of that, to get out ahead of that problem versus a lot of that inbound coming into the team. Yeah. So Ren, I want to ask you, what are some typical offenders or what are things that you see, find the team commonly automating from all the, just the different interactions that you're having with customers? Yeah, so I think um, the biggest thing that we're trying to cut down on these days are the whizmos, right? The where is my order, which aren't necessarily value add interactions. It's either people that are really used to Amazon culture. And if it's not here in six hours, like where, the, where is it? Um, or, you know, like Megan was alluding to fulfillment issues, you know, in this, these wild times of COVID. Um, for us, I know that our manufacturers are overseas. There's been a lot of breaks in our supply chain. And I know that this doesn't necessarily have to make or break a customer experience when it's upheld from our team. And so similar to Megan, um, we have in place via Clavio, um, automated emails that go out when there are shipping delays. So, you know, our fulfillment promise is to ship within one to three days. And if it goes past this three day timeline, they'll get an automatic email that's personalized to them, letting them know. And our feeling has been the same, Megan, of like, people are usually grateful when they understand a little bit more. And this will dissuade a lot of these people reaching out. Um, because as you guys all know, CX usually can't solve the problems that a customer is reaching out about, but we can better communicate with them around these things. And so it's setting up all these systems that we can be better informing our customers, but not pissing them off by like, we hope they won't notice, um, but they will. <laughs> um, and then the other thing, like I mentioned before, is we have auto responses via email that go out to every email and it's customizing some of these in line with Shopify information. Information so it can automatically share this information with the customer right off the bat. You know, if their status is fulfilled or unfulfilled, where they're at in the order process. And so we will still have to follow up with them, but they'll get probably what they're most curious about right off the bat. And then we can address anything else. And so there will always be that personal touch point, but giving them some sort of information at the get go. Like, we know, we hear you. They're probably checking in about this. Um, if it's something else, like, let us know um, and we'll be in touch soon but finding this balance between automation and personal interactions. Definitely, interesting. Okay, um, so I guess, Megan, since we're talking about this fulfillment issue, I've actually never heard of this. So do you mind just quickly breaking down like at a super high level, how do you actually build that automation in Clavio? Like, is it a filter where it's like, if order placed X days in between fulfillment like, and has been shipped, can you like quickly walk through the logic? Cause it sounds like a very cool automation that a lot of brands would probably get a lot of value add. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's very, very simple um, with the Clavio and Shopify integration that has basically Clavio can pull in when a customer is sent a shipping update. Um, so if they have not been sent a shipping update, that means their order has not been fulfilled and they have not gotten the tracking information to track where their order is. Um, so we just set up a time delay that says if the shipping update has not gone out after um, two or three days after the order has been placed, um, send the customer this email. So we've actually taken it a little bit of a step further, um, both in Clavio as a as an as an email flow, as well as in Gorgeous with some of the macro responses. But if the customer, um, we segment the customer down a little bit more than that. So if the customer is a first time customer, they're actually getting a different response than if someone is a subscriber and gets a monthly shipment. Um, reason being, the subscriber may um, know that you know, based on the last six orders, their order is typically fulfilled within one to two days. Um, this new customer who might be experiencing something that's more like three or four days might not realize that. So we're letting them know, here's the situation, here's why it's happening, here's you know, what we're doing to fix it. Um, and also we can then segment different um, essentially incentives to bring the customer back. So if a customer is signed up for a subscription, um, and like I said, they know that this is not a normal thing that they're dealing with, um, they might not need an additional incentive to come back and purchase later. But if someone is a new customer and they've never bought from us before, um, perhaps we you know, can remind them that if this time doesn't work, that we're also available on Amazon. We also um, can provide another incentive to say, you know, we're apo apologies for the delay, but here's a $5 gift card um, to come back and shop with us later. Yeah, it's a nice two for one benefit because I'm assuming that also reduces a ton of tickets that will come in of the, oh, Ren, I already forgot your acronym, but it was perfect of the like, where is my order? So Wism Wismos, yeah. Wismos, right. <laughs> I have to remember that. That's a good one. Okay. So yeah, so that's, that's a nice one that probably reduces a lot of team. And then also, Megan, as you mentioned, like you can throw a lot of incentives and or other CTAs for people to do something else while they're waiting. So that's, that's a good takeaway. So a tool, what are you all finding over at AutoBrush that you're all like, are the typical things that you're automating or something that you found to be a really big win recently? Yeah. So there, there's actually a few things that we've automated right now, um, specifically like middle funnel and bottom of funnel chats. Uh, what we've done is we've uh, aggregated our, like most common chat inquiries. And so we use Gordis to automate uh, replies to those questions. A really good example of that, like in practice, um, a common question that we get is like, does the auto brush work for braces? And so if a customer types that in chat, they'll get a, you know, a scripted reply. And um, <clears throat> that actually has had a really significant impact on like our overall chat conversion efficiency um, just by uh, using automations uh, for pre-purchase chats alone. I, I think we're, we're able to see like a 21 to 25% conversion rate off of, off of those automations. Um, another area is like negative reviews and like negative post-purchase survey responses. Um, you know, definitely the subsequent replies need to be highly personalized, but we send an automated first reply email to customers when they provide us uh, with a negative review or uh, provide like, any type of negative experience. Um, that first reply is going to be immediate, like as soon as they submit that negative review or negative post-purchase survey. Um, and it really, really helps to provide just a, an immediate um, resolution and offers uh offers the opportunity for a, cus a customer to re-engage with us again. Um, another area is return requests. So we use Happy Returns to provide self-service options for customers that uh, want to initiate returns for our brand. And so essentially, it's a pretty seamless experience. Customers will uh, initiate their return in the returns portal. And um, you know, as soon as they ship it out, you know, their order is refunded right away. And so it's really a seamless customer experience. And then another area is help centers. So not necessarily automation per se, but um, investment in your help center is a really, really great asset, like in a great idea. Like right now we're deflecting about 35% of our like incoming ticket volume in general with just help, help docs alone. Wow. Okay. 
that that sounds like a lot. So it sounds like you're also getting the immediate, it sounds like immediacy is also a really big part of reaching back out to the customer as soon as something negative comes in to make sure that that's handled. And then kind of as we were talking about before, right, you can automate that front line and then eventually get to the team. So it sounds like a really good, also to kick off to kind of what my next question was gonna be, and Kendra, I'm gonna put you in the hot seat first this time, is what are some really big changes you've made to your CX program recently that have a, a very big impact and anything on like repurchase rates, lifetime value, kind of those more of long-term KPIs that a lot of brands are looking at? Yeah, I've got a barking dog in the background, so sorry about that. Um, well, one one key thing I think is like we did a lot of work. Um, we measure NPS, Net Promoter Score, um, and one of the things that we really did there was we really sliced and diced our Net Promoter Score data by different factors and tried to find out what really caused lower scores. For us, we found out that click to delivery is a big one. So how long it takes from someone when someone shops to when they actually get, when they click on the site to when they actually get their product. Um, Amazonification of of e commerce is just here and we have to live with it um and so I, what i would say is like by slicing and dicing the data we really figured out where we needed to intervene so we know that if a customer waits 14 days for their package from when they clicked they're not they're more likely to be a give us a lower score on our net promoter so we actually proactively apologize for that after they've received their delivery. And we found similar to what Megan was mentioning, just by, and Ren too, just by acknowledging that we like didn't meet our own standards and apologizing, we actually find that has a really big um, uh, retention because uh, we can measure these customers. Do they come back? It's boosted our retention. It's boosted our lifetime value. We do give some uh, offers or gift cards, kind of depending on what we've been testing. But we just we we just want them to know that like that those timelines like are not acceptable. They they happen and like you know there is so much now with COVID and and the USPS that makes it difficult to even like <laughs> to even meet expectations sometimes just with the way that postal service is working but by acknowledging that we don't think that's the right amount of time that we think that's unacceptable and that that's not normal we find especially with first-time customers that we can really make an impact on their retention and their overall happiness and net promoter score with us so i lied we just like to be really honest and upfront um, and clear and use that data to figure out when we need to intervene and, and test different things. So we use Clavio as well. And we do a lot of A-B testing of different types of offers and different types of language even. Um, and we found a lot of success just by tweaking the way we word it. So yeah, that's one thing that I think has been really um, impactful for us. Yeah, that's super cool. And is that another automation where it's just like X time between order created and when delivered? And if it passes whatever your window is, is that email is automated to customers as well? Or yeah, is that like a personal yeah. thing? Yeah, definitely enables that along with like our, we have a Wismo, um, we have a post order tracking system that enables some of that uh, on top of that, on top of just Clavio. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Ren, same question to you. What's been a big thing that's helped you in the, the Purus recently? Yeah. So an interesting thing about Tushy, um, as I mentioned, you know, we had, we got slammed by COVID, which was both a blessing and left lots of problems, but we were a really, really small company and we grew 10 X during that time. So prior to COVID CX was a two person team, um, that was highly reactive. And at our peak, we've been 25, 26. So what we're living through now is a totally different department and team than what it looked like a year ago. So there was a lot of basic foundations that needed to be put into play. Um, so I think one of the biggest um, accomplishments was building a really robust training center um, for our new Purus and, and old Purus alike. We call it the Tushy Ass Room because we built it in Google Classroom and we've got to get a butt pun in wherever we can. Um, so that was kind of something that, you know, now actually today I had a new class of Purus that are starting and it's like, wow, this is so easy, especially on a remote team to be able to do this autonomously. Um, but impacting customers of late that I found a really great boon to um, the job that the Purus do is personalization through our satisfaction surveys and pers greater personalizations within Gorgeous. I think 
um, leaning into our vulnerabilities has really paid off a lot. And I think, you know, when people look at your social media accounts and see that you have hundreds of thousands of followers, they just assume mega corporation doesn't care about me and where we can imbue back, like you're talking to a real person and her name is Cheryl and this is what she looks like. And here's her really cheeky bio that she wrote. Like here's an example of, um, one of the bios uh, will cook a panty dropping risotto after flying 13 hours. Can't poo without tissue travel. No TP, no problem. Even my toddler loves it. Um, so kind of, you know, in the voice of Tushy, but sharing who these people are and, and giving them an opportunity to be their authentic selves. So we in instated the system about a month and a half ago and already saw a one point difference in the first week in our CSAT ratings. And before, I think they just saw us as a faceless bought maybe for a lot of these people but just the difference you know the first responses were like oh my gosh uh my wife is filipina and this you know and real, was really creating real personal interactions and a greater appreciation that there's a human that's responding to this and humans are fallible and we know we made a mistake but we've got your back and really being able to put a face to a name but also the creative um tushy brand voice and cheekiness to it um, that just adds an extra layer of, um, you know, there is all these fancy bells and whistles, but at the end of the day, it's human to human and, and we're working through this together. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such a great point of also like personalization can come from making the company more personal and showing off the personality of the company that I think a, a lot of companies strive to do as well. Also, I realized that maybe not everybody knows do you mind just quickly explaining what a Puru is? Yes. So a Puru, this is what we call all of our customer service agents. They are poop gurus. We're helping you poop better. Um, so, so yeah, that's the name for, for all of our team members. And as you probably can tell, we like to have a lot of fun with language. Um, and so that's one of the greatest um, advantages of this role is leaning into your nine-year-old self that you got in trouble for having toilet talk at the table. And this is what our, a lot of our customers really appreciate about us. Um, so they lean into that hard. Yes, definitely. It's always, always a good opportunity to make a good poop joke. So <laughs> yeah. Atul, kind of the same question for you. Like what have been some big changes in auto brushes program that have had a, a really big impact recently? Yeah, um, definitely to piggyback off of um, Ren, like a major focus for us this year has also been CSAT. Um, so again, just reaching out to really resolve every negative customer experience, it goes a really long way. Um, you know, it's not the most glamorous thing in the world, um, but it goes a, a long way to help improve your customer satisfaction downstream and um, really help you re-engage with customers as well and pr potentially provide them like repurchase discounts, et cetera, like an opportunity to right a wrong as, uh, as well. But I think more importantly, the benefit of doing that has really allowed us to be a little bit more agile and flexible when it comes to like how we're handling certain tickets. Like we'll have a, I have a group working session with uh, my team every every month and we'll go over our, our top DSATs and we'll go over them together and brainstorm like solutions, um, solutions to them to really understand, okay, well, this is what we can do differently. Our goal is to hit 4.9 this year um, we're, we're getting close. We're like at 4.7 right now, but really like using those negative experiences as launching pads for downstream improvement, super important. Um, it's also helped us um, re-engage churn customers too. So we, uh, a month and a half ago, we uh, launched a win back campaign to win back customers who had churned out of our brand. Um, and we were able to re-engage uh, a user segment of approximately 1,300 customers by delivering that, that same type of personalization. Um, and literally, I've had my agents like reaching out to, to these customers. Um, it was a big project, but we were able to re-engage with over 1,300 customers who had churned from our brand um, and give them like a you know, significant repurchase discount and get them back into the funnel. And then the last part, and I think this is probably the most significant for me is um, social media comments and pre-purchase inquiries, like using those as like a launch pad for CS profitability. Um, it, it's a really good opportunity to educate and inform customers about your product and brand. But like by doing this, we're also able to track conversions off of CS related conversations and the revenue that we generate 
kind of like directly offsets um, the costs associated with you know, our team and also like adds profit profitability back to uh, back to Autobrush, which is uh, which is pretty cool too. Yeah, I'm sure definitely something that the exec team is super happy about. Uh, I feel like that's what a lot a lot of teams are trying to figure out. That's very cool that you all figured out that process. And I'm assuming from those 1,300 outreaches, you probably also have a lot of good automations that now you can put in place and work with the marketing team so that the team doesn't have to reach out to all of those people again. Yeah, so we we actually use Clavio for that uh, initial outreach and and Typeform to like qualify customers, um, but we that follow up with the customer was was personalized. So that first response was um, was automated. Mm-hmm. Very cool. There's probably some more mid funnel and lower funnel automation there too. So it sounds like we're going to drop in some things like CSAT, like MPS, but I would love to know what are the KPIs that you all really use to drive your CX program forward? So Megan, do you mind just sharing like what are some like the most important metrics that you all are tracking? So the two most important metrics that we're tracking really for the entire business is um, number one, customer payback period, uh, which is just when this customer becomes profitable for the business. Um, And number two is contribution margin per customer. Um, So these are two stats that we like really our whole business revolves around, Um, not just the the customer experience team, but really everybody in the company. Um, And we're able to pull those, um, look at trends, pull them based on different cohorts, segmentation, et cetera, shout out to Dacity because that's how we're able to do that um, and, and really understand what um, how things are trending over time, especially when it comes to uh, some of those uh, segmentations like, uh, like Kendra mentioned around fulfill- time to fulfillment or time to receiving order um, to understand what we need to do as a business to, to keep those high. Definitely. One, thank you for the shout out. Two, I, I agree. I think contribution margin per customer is the least measured data point in e-com, but I'll, this isn't about me. I'm not talking today. So Kendra, what KPIs are you all using over at Dr. Squatch to really guide your program? Yeah. So for us in CX, we're, we're more focused on um, the experience they're having with the brand. We have other teams focused on like LTV and, and customer cohorts. Um, so really for me, net promoter score is a huge um, number that the whole company looks at. And we um, do that on a transactional basis. So we, every customer, we ask them for a net promoter score. And then CSAT for me is probably the big one when it comes to my customer support team. Related though, we've seen that our SLA, so how quickly we get back to customers if we're meeting their expectations, which now is like a pretty tight window in the sort of like immediacy world of text messaging and chat and Facebook Messenger. So really we're trying to get back to people very quickly and we, really keep a close eye on SLAs, um, service level agreements, meeting those like windows of time, we expect them to reply and also to resolve the customer's issues because those are really leading indicators of CSAT for us. So we kind of tie those together and keep a close eye on those in terms of our support team performance. Yeah, so that would be like time to response and then time to resolution. That's right, yeah. So like first response time, like how quickly do we get back to them when they sent us an email or a chat? Um, we try to keep those under a day for email. Um, and then for for chat, it's like we try to keep that under like five minutes. So it's really oh. the team is really fo- laser focused on that first response time and trying to resolve the issue. And honestly, like one of the best ways I've seen in my career that resolution time can be shortened is giving your team a lot of autonomy to make decisions in the moment, because when they have to kind of follow a rule book or check policy or ask kind of ask for help or ask if it's okay, ask for permission, it elongates the customer's time to resolution. And nowadays, I think rightfully so, customers expect a lot from brands and want an authentic interaction with an agent. Um, You know, that maybe the customers who are lying or being fraudulent, like that is not the norm. And so I really love to give my team autonomy to make a kind of outlandish decision. You need to replace that package go for it, right? Like if you think that's the right thing to do for that customer, go ahead and do it. And that really tightens the window of resolution time for us. Yeah, definitely. Nice pro tip we've done there. Uh, So Ren, what KPIs are you all using at Tushy to guide the program forward? It sounds like Kendra and I are on the same page that all of Megan's tracking are amazing 
but yeah, I'm strictly focused on CX. Um, so the guiding star for us is typically CSAT um, with response time, response time right there because usually when first response time slows, we slip. Um, but these are, you know, strong indicators for us of working for customers, what's not. Um, the other thing that I uh, like to keep a tight hold on is return rate, um, specifically for us that we have a pretty highly nuanced product that, you know, most people are not plumbers. For most people, this is their first foray into anything handy. And so the right, the quick response is, this isn't compatible with my toilet or I can't, this is not, cannot be installed. Well, we know it can be installed on probably 97% of toilets. They just need a little guidance. So we look a lot to of like the return request rate and the actual return rate. Um, and we've been really um, fortunate with our team of Purus that they can save almost any return unless the customer is just like no way, no how, or they have like an antique newfangled toilet um, or newfangled toilet, antique or newfangled. Um, and so typically we've seen that below 2% our return rate, which um, that's been something that I want to keep really low um, because it just speaks, you know, we're in this space where we're indoctrinating culture on something that's wholly new and we want them to have an easy time, but also understand when they come to our team, that's where they'll get the greater support that they might need because we have customers that can't tell the difference between a fork and a screwdriver. And for those, we have video installation um, helpers. So, you know, there's all we want, like I said before, there should always be value add when they're touching our team. And this is just one example. Um, and so, yeah, those are the three metrics that we're tracking. But as this department is still very young, wanting to get to a more sophisticated place too of tracking all the things, but also not killing ourselves with just having dashboards for dashboards sake, really knowing what the drivers are in the business and, and how that can impact CX overall. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, a 2% return rate is incredible. So I'm sure everybody's <laughs> very happy about that. Yeah. So kind of in the same theme of data, how else are you gathering or what other data are you gathering from customers to just help improve the business? So the tool, I'm going to put you, I'm going to, I'm going to start you off, start this question off with you. Yeah. So there are several touch points where we collect data and a lot of them actually start from like using a type form. Um, <clears throat> we have like over the last year and a half, I think we've sent over 60 different type form surveys, but I'm going to talk about two specific evergreen surveys that we send um, to every customer. Um, and the first one is post-purchase. So it's 14 days after a customer's product has been delivered. Um, this survey asks like basic questions like, you know, how happy were you with your AutoBrush experience? Do you have any feedback about, um, about our product, et cetera? Like very, very specific detailed questions um and it actually is awesome because it like helps to influence product changes um as well as like influence how we're educating customers too um and it also really helps us uh helps give us an early indication of like whether or not like a new product launch is successful another one that we've started to send kind of recently well not so recent but um we we put into the rotation during Black Friday uh, of last year was a research survey. Um, we send this two days after a customer's purchase. Um, we ask uh, kind of open-ended questions like how their shopping experience was, um, questions like how easy was it to find the answers you were looking for? What other products would you like to seen, um, would you like to have seen on our site? Um, and, you know, that type of information has been incredibly val valuable. Um, it's helped to influence like, like on-site copy, um, additions to our help center. Um, it's also allowed us to uh, optimize different customer touch points to on-site to really like hone in um, on which areas we can um, really improve our like mid mid funnel, bottom of funnel uh, purchasing experiences. Um, and then lastly, Facebook comments data. Um, we get a lot of top of funnel Facebook comments. And so for us, like that top of funnel Facebook um, comment, like it's those comments are a window into the minds of your potential shoppers. Um, and this really has helped us influence uh, 
site copy on our like PDPs. We actually redesigned our website and we added FAQs um, uh, based off of like our top trending top of funnel questions um, and had a like pretty significant impact on site performance as a whole. Um, so in general, those are some of the kind of like high level data um, data points that we, we make use of at Autobrush. Very cool. Seems to be like very encompassing of the entire experience where between site optimization, marketing, there's a lot to do there and a lot that you can pass back and help the team with. So Megan, kind of from the other side there, what are, what are some great ways that you all are capturing data and then just using that to leverage and help the business? Yeah, so um, I'm in my role, I'm a little bit uh, more focused on customer behavior and what, what actions that they're actually taking um, on the site, specifically like repurchase rate. Um, so again, similar to what I know Kendra spoke about, like we're running analysis on how times delivery really affects overall LTV and repurchase rate for new customers and existing customers um, and using that information to better understand where we can potentially, um, first of all, like what are the expectations for um, fulfillment time from, from when someone places an order, but additionally, what can we get away with in terms of ship time as well? Um, so obviously we wanna always surprise and delight and, and provide customers with the uh, the expectation that they get with Amazon, which is a two day ship time. But if we're able to um, understand where, where we actually have like an inflection point on our repurchase rate based on ship time, and we have a little bit more wiggle room there, um, especially with certain customers and we can improve our overall um, just uh, gross margin for the brand, um, we'll, we'd love to take those opportunities to do so. So digging in and understanding repurchase rates and where those inflection points happen based on um, when the customer receives their order. Yeah, I feel like that's a cool like second or third level value prop you can include on site and in marketing around what their expectations are and sell into that and kind of change the experience around that as well. Very cool. So Kendra, what other data points are you all capturing at Dr. Squatch? How are you using that in the business? Yeah, so we um, we see ourselves as a really great source of qualitative data um, for the company. So we actually have a lot of different places where we're gathering insights by just reading things. I know that sounds very basic and boring, but um, my team spends a lot of time reading comments on social media. We actually have our own private Facebook group and we'll do polls in there and sort of report out on those, which gets a little quantitative, but you know, we'll like ask for suggestions, things people want to see. We're a big part of the product ideas funnel into our product uh, development team. And I actually, we actually sit within our product team in customer experience, which is, I think, a little unique. Um, so we're really like feeding qualitative data, whereas other teams, I think, can find a lot of the great quantitative data. So we're, yeah, we're just doing a lot of reading and a lot of reporting on that qualitative data. And we found that through trackers and through trying to keep them, turning them kind of more into quantitative analysis, we can really impact um, the direction the company is going, some of the things around the digital experience. I agree, like we have such rich data for PDPs. Um, we do deep dives into our information requests, which for us are top of funnel tickets where customers are asking just kind of random info about our products, um, how they work, like do they, what do they work for, um, all kinds of crazy questions, but if we can find trends in there, like those can go on to the PDP. We can share that information back to our web team or even maybe our paid media team. It's like, hey, we're seeing this trend. People are asking this question. Maybe you should make an ad about this and, and try to push kind of the this answer um, as a hook or a catch because it seems very popular with our customers. So there's lots of great quantitative data we share, but I would say that like we're really the key holders of great qualitative customer data. Very cool. Yeah, you're kind of like the voice of the customer internally yeah. within the org. Exactly. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to open it up to q and I've got one last question, uh, but if you have any Q&A, please drop it in the Q&A panel and we'll ask the panel directly. But I guess kind of my like one last, well, I actually have another question after this, but my last question for this section before I open it up is what are areas of the entire CX experience or automation that like if you had a magic wand or like a paintbrush, you would want there to be like five years complete development team to build out or support or some sort of function. So Atul, I'm gonna put you on the I'm gonna put you on the hot seat first. Like if you dream state, what's the one thing that you wish existed? Um just more more technical solutions. Uh, I think like a lot of 
<laughs> a lot of I didn't really have time to think about this question. I should have uh, I should have prepped for this, but like in terms of other areas where I'd like to personalize more, I think um, if there was a way to um, tether in, um, you know, automations with personalizations via technical solutions, I think that's. I mean, that's how we're currently able to automate right now. Is like the personal solutions or sorry, the technical solutions that are available um, that allow us to engage with customers. I don't think they're, they're there yet from a personalization perspective. I think once the technology really starts to catch up and as like, um, as solutions really start to evolve um, and machine learning algorithm processes really start to evolve over time, I think like it'll allow us to maybe add more personal touches to automations. Um, but in terms of other areas, one area that we're focusing on is um, abandoned carts. Um, I know that um, we already have an abandoned cart flow through through Clavio uh, like right now, but um, we're actually trying something a little bit different. Um, we're kind of proactively segmenting customers. Um, as soon as they abandon their cart, we're offering to reach back out to them or schedule like a, a, a call to connect with them to see if they have any questions. So far, it's actually worked pretty well. Um, we just launched it about, I want to say two, two, three weeks ago, and we've already called about 15, 20 customers so far um, in its testing phase. So abandoned carts for sure. Um, I think it would be nice to add more of a human element to abandoned carts. I think right now, like abandoned cart flows, they're all like, you know, very set, like you get a discount uh, and you're served served an email, right? But it's, you know, it would be nice to add more of a human element to abandoned carts. But I think like personalization in general, um, I think as technical solutions really evolve, you'll start to see a bridging of that gap between automation and personalization, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. And that abandoned cart flow in Clavio also is just a great marketing tactic to lead with CS because it's, it's amazing how many people will respond and buy just from asking if they need anything. So Megan, magic wand, what, what do you want to see? So this is like, this is probably possible in some way. If somebody wants to tell me how to do this, I would love to hear it. Um, but something that's come up recently is, you know, I think when you think about, uh, I'm, I'm highly focused around the fulfillment time because it is obviously an issue that I'm dealing with right now um, in my current daily every day. Um, but I think it would be really fantastic to have something that could really kind of connect the different tools. So um, in a similar way to our 3 pl has, you know, a promise to us to fulfill, you know, an order within a certain time frame. Um, we also should really be providing um, the same promise to our customers. And if we fall outside of that, there should be a penalty. So I would like to know how I can set up an automation to <laughs> have, um, you know, send customers at different um, you know, segments and also different timeframes to fulfill, how can I send automatically send them a gift card um, to Wandering Bear Coffee so that they come back and, and buy again? Somebody can do that, I know. <laughs> uh, are you talking about tying your free PL data to Klaviyo? Uh, it would have to be Klaviyo too. Like we use rise.ai for, for gift card um, or store credit. Um, so it would be tying essentially the Klaviyo data to the- to Rise data? Yeah. I don't know if they have integration yet, but they should. So <laughs> it's not a native integration. There might be some sort of connector out there that I'm not aware of, but <laughs> definitely. Or, or there should be an integration. They should be building one soon. So um, also Wonderment apparently uh, ties to Clavia. So if you're, if you're looking to move potentially to a different gift card platform, um, so same question to you, Kendra, one thing, if you could just re rebuild the CX program and have your own, if your own process, what would it be? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, this is doable. It's just expensive. I, I think that website shopping personalization is the future and is expected by most customers. I think they don't understand that it is like 
out of the box 100k even for small sites so it's like it's not very um, affordable for most of us as we like start our DTC companies and are growing um, but I would love to be able to take a customer through a very like unique journey based off information we know about them take them to certain types of our products so we have like you know, we have subscription, but we also have bundles, which we there are customers who really draw to bundles and want to try us out. There are customers who are just ready to subscribe right away and really being able to optimize their journey through like as like the beginning phases with us. And then when they come back and then as they're interacting with us and knowing that information, um, it's totally doable, but it's just pricey. And I hope that it becomes more reasonable. If someone builds a cool Shopify add on that makes it cheaper. I don't know, but um, I think that customers should have a really, like we should know a lot about customers. We should have a CRM. That's also not like Clavio can serve that purpose a little bit but I haven't seen it as robustly in the B2C space as I have in the B2B space. And I think we should know more about our customers. We should serve them better um, experiences on our website and we should take all that knowledge through their co any customer service experience they might have. So that would be my like magic wand. I would have a lot of information and maybe a creepy way on my customers and I would help them have a great customized experience because of it. Yeah, well, if it's a great customer experience, it isn't creepy, so they would they wouldn't know. But uh, yeah, just tying all the data that's out there together is going to be super valuable. So, Ren, same question to you, Magic Wand. What, what would you want to see? Yeah, Magic Wand, truly magical wand, would be re-educating all customers on how to interact with CX. I think a lot of the tools that I'm looking towards um, that will automate a lot of our process or agilize things for the customer are reliant upon changing their behavior, right? It's recurring to chat, to self-serve chat bots. And, um, you know, currently 70% of our communication goes through email. You know, you order from an e-commerce site, you get the emails, you just respond to the email, um, which, you know, you'll get a quick response time, but not as quick on chat. So I think understanding um, how to change customer behavior and educate them of like, we've, Habilitated all these really cool things that you're not using because you don't know they exist. So figuring out the best way to posit these to our customers. Um, and then I think piggybacking on Megan's idea, something that I want to put into play very soon is um, linking our rewards program um, to some of these negative customer experiences, like, you know, sending out an automated email and automatically giving them what we call butt bucks, you know, those are our reward points. Um, so maybe this is a way that you could leverage it by using a rewards program to give these things. And, and also a company goal or a CX goal is moving away from refunds towards store credit um, and figuring out, you know, how to keep more money in our pocket. But also we have lots of different products that people aren't necessarily aware of um, and store credit, you know, keeps them within the fold. They buy other things that are great for their bathroom, but figuring out the best way to leverage these two um, rewards points and store credit as ways to surprise and delight. Yeah, definitely. Kind of like it's very, ironically very old school retail tactics that now it'd be great to have the flexibility in e-com. Um, yeah. So I actually was expecting that to take so long, but we are actually at time. Uh, I just want to thank everybody who joined us today and thank you to the incredible panel for taking the time. Uh, my team would be really mad at me. So just let everybody know our next event is August 18th, where we'll be talking about order automation and fulfillment. We have another great merchant panel lined up for that all in the preparation for holiday. But again, I just really want to thank the panel for all your time today and all the wisdom that you shared with everyone. Thanks, it was real fun. Thank you. Always Thanks a pleasure. so much.